Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Jennifer DeRosa. I am the program coordinator for the Energy and Environmental Programs at Johns Hopkins University. And I would like to welcome you all today for joining us. Um, this is part five of the Water, Energy and Food Nexus speaker series that we've been offering this year. And for the last several talks in this series, we have looked at the role of the water energy food nexus in international security and conflict, in smart water infrastructure for farmers, and the impact of climate change on agriculture and food. And today, we're gonna to turn our attention to an important piece of the water energy food nexus, that of energy. Not harnessing energy, but storing energy. Our speaker today is Dr. Eric Kazik. He is currently a postdoctoral fellow from the University of Michigan. Eric received his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Maryland and his PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Michigan. His doctoral work is focused on understanding and overcoming the challenges of next generation lithium metal anodes for high energy density batteries with focus on interface chemistry and design. Eric has authored more than 20 peer reviewed journal articles in the fields of energy storage and conversion. His current work is focused primarily on two topics that he's passionate about. The first is enabling fast charging in extreme conditions in large format lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles. And the second is improving manufacturability, cost and rate compatibility of next generation solid state batteries. Hello everyone and, and thank you, Jen, for that kind introduction. Um, and thank you to the audience for tuning in from, from all over the world, hopefully. And I'm really excited to share with you some of my work today on the role of energy storage in transitioning our society to a more sustainable one and how batteries can fill that role. So we all know that the global demand for food, water, and energy is increasing as the global population continues to grow, now approaching 8 billion. And as more of those people start to live more consumptive life lifestyles, for instance, more people are transitioning from starch-based diets to more meat and dairy. And as a consequence, the energy, water, and land resources used all increase dramatically. In general, it's almost impossible to isolate any one of these three aspects, food, water, and energy. As there are always links between them, whether it is the water used for fracking to extract natural gas, or the energy used to pump water or to process food. As we strive towards a sustainable society, it is imperative to consider not only these three aspects indep independently, but the interconnections between them. This has really been the focus of this sem seminar series. And so while I'll spend a lot of time today speaking about energy and energy storage, really changes in the energy sector will have impacts throughout our society and throughout this water energy food nexus. So with that, let's take a look at how we generate and use energy in the United States. So there's a lot going on here. I could probably spend half of today's talk just kind of teasing out some of the intricacies of this plot. But I wanna point out just a few things. One, still as of 2019, more than three quarters of our energy in the United States comes from fossil fuels, which of course are water intensive and polluting both in the sense of air quality, particulates, heavy metals, things like that. And of course, uh, carbon dioxide emissions contributing to climate change. I'd also like to point out on the right side of this plot over here that over two thirds of the energy that we use is wasted. So there are enormous opportunities for energy efficiency improvements as well. Now of the cleaner renewable sources of, of energy such as solar and wind, almost all of that goes to electricity generation. Now these sources are inherently intermittent or non-dispatchable because we can't tell the sun when to shine or the wind when to blow, we get a variation in the amount of production shown here in this orange and, and yellow in the, for the solar and wind over the course of the days, weeks, and months. 
So in order to utilize these intermittent cleaner sources at a large scale, hopefully eventually getting to 100%, we really need to add more storage capability that can fill in the troughs and valleys um, and, and really meet the demand across all of the times that it's cloudy or the wind's not blowing. I'd also like to point out that nearly all of the energy used in the transportation sector currently comes from petroleum or oil. And this is of course because we burn things like gasoline and jet fuel to transport ourselves all over the world. And we use these fuels because they're very energy dense and portable. So we need a way to store the renewable energy that we produce electricity from and use it for transportation. So energy storage is really vital for the, both the decarbonization of the transportation sector and for enabling larger implementation of inter intermittent renewable electricity sources, such as wind and solar. And together, electricity production and transportation represent over half of the greenhouse gas emissions. So first, let's take a look at the transportation sector. And really we have at least three options to displace gasoline as our primary fuel for transportation. The first is fuel cells. And in fuel cells, we take a fuel such as hydrogen and use an electrochemical device to combine the hydrogen with oxygen and generate electricity. So really these are still electric vehicles, but we're producing that electricity in a different way than battery electric vehicles in the middle where we can charge our battery with any source of electricity, hopefully renewables, and then discharge them on demand. And finally, we can use bio-derived fuels where we take plants like corn, soybeans, sugarcane, or even algae and produce combustible fuels. Now, unfortunately, the current technologies that are used for this, predominantly corn ethanol uh, and soy-based biodiesel, they have a relatively low energy return on investment, which means that you have to put a lot of energy in compared to the energy that you get out. And while there are some technologies that are showing promise for increasing that, they're not ready for scale up yet. And there are also a lot of land use implications here. So growing these crops will compete with food crops for the land use. Um, and there's a lot of water that's used that can contribute to deforestation. So in my opinion, these fuels do have a role to play but they're better reserved for the applications that are more difficult to electrify by other means, such as aviation, uh, space travel, things like that. Now, the other two, we have fuel cell on the top and our battery electric vehicle on the bottom. And since we can't just go out and mine hydrogen, we have to make it, the ultimate source of this energy is the same. So whether that's the current blend of fossil fuels plus some renewables or hopefully in the future, uh, almost completely renewables, it's coming from however we're generating electricity. For hydrogen, uh, typically we can take water and use electricity to split that into hydrogen and oxygen. And then we have to compress or liquefy the hydrogen and transport it. And then we can use the fuel cell to turn that into electricity. And at each step along the way, we have efficiency losses. So when you started with 100% of electricity, after you go through the fuel cell, you have around 30% of that electricity left. And then you can use that. And typically you have a small battery in a fuel cell electric vehicle that can help you accelerate and things like that. So the end uh, efficiency overall is about 30%, so not very good. And currently actually most of our hydrogen doesn't come from water splitting. It comes from splitting methane. So we're really using fossil fuels there as well. Uh, so this is not ideal. In contrast, for battery electric vehicles, we do have some losses associated with transportation uh, of the electricity from wherever it's generated to wherever you're charging your battery. But you know, for instance, if you have solar panels on your roof, that can be even better than 80%. Um, and then batteries themselves are very efficient, upwards of 95% efficient, uh, comparing the energy that you put in to the energy that you get out. So the overall efficiency is quite high, more than double the overall efficiency for, for hydrogen fuel cells, for instance. So what this means is that, assuming that we have the same source of electricity, we'd need more than double 
the wind turbines and solar panels to generate this, to, to travel the same distance on fuel cells compared to batteries. So I hope I've convinced you that really battery electric vehicles are currently at least the most promising means to reduce the impacts of the transportation sector, which currently contributes to nearly 30% of the greenhouse gas emissions. But, you know, I've been staying, as I've been saying all along, the, we need the electricity that we're charging these electric vehicles with to come from renewable sources. So that grid scale storage component comes into play here as well. We can't just have battery electric vehicles because then we don't really win the game, right? We're, we're still using fossil fuels to drive our cars. We're just decoupling where the emissions are from where the car is. So let's take a look at grid scale storage. Currently, worldwide and in the United States, it's about the same. Our current storage capacity is about 2% of the total generating capacity. And almost all of that is what's called pump storage hydroelectric, where we pump water up a hill when we have extra electricity, and then we let it flow down the hill through a turbine to generate electricity when we need more electricity, when, when demand is higher than the supply. Now, the downside of this is that it's very geographically constrained. You need two bodies of water at the bottom and the top of a large hill nearby to where you're generating a large amount of electricity. And as a result, we've kind of saturated most of the good places for this worldwide. And we've seen relatively limited growth of this in the last two decades. So then if we need more storage, where can that come from? Well, the balance, the little sliver of the pie chart here comes from a variety of different kinds of batteries, but mostly lithium ion batteries, as well as some mechanical and electromechanical uh, means of storing electricity such as compressing air into a cavern and letting it flow out when we need more uh, supply, but that's also very geographically con constrained. And then we have uh, a flywheels as well. But particularly in the last few years, really, the lithium ion battery component of this has started to skyrocket. You can see here as shown in blue, that's the lithium ion component. And you know, really just since 2010, 2011, the amount of grid scale storage capacity for lithium ions has really dramatically increased. And this is driven predominantly by the decrease in cost of batteries that has occurred over the past decade or so, or even less than a decade. You can see here that in the past few years, the cost has come down from over $500 per kilowatt hour. And remember the kilowatt hour is a unit of energy. That's how we pay for electricity at our homes. Um, you might pay 15 cents per kilowatt hour or something like that. So this is kind of a, a that's an, as much as energy as it would take to run a microwave for about an hour. Um, so it's kind of a, that's how you should think about this. And it's that price for that has come down from over $500 to in some cases less than $100 per kilowatt hour now. And that's again, driven by the rapid increase in production of battery electric vehicles and with economies of scale come reductions in price. So while there are some other options out there such as flow batteries and molten metal batteries, really lithium ion batteries are again, one of the leading options for grid storage. And since EVs, electric vehicles will really dominate the demand for these, they are also dictating the progress that we make in the technology and the cost of those batteries. And that's why the rest of the presentation will mostly focus on electric vehicle applications. But again, that, that has implications in the other spaces as well. I, I'd be happy to take some questions on some of the other options for grid storage, such as flow batteries and, and such in the Q&A session if you, if you are interested in that. So I hope I've convinced you that batteries will play a really important role in our transition towards a sustainable society. And the rest of the talk will dive into how batteries work, ways to make them better, and the impacts associated with manufacturing them. And finally, we'll take a look at some exciting new developments in battery technologies that could really change the energy storage game in the coming years. So how do rechargeable batteries work? I'm a big fan of, of analogies, and I like to think about batteries as a pair of sealed water tanks at different heights with a pipe and a valve in between. 
Now this system stores energy in the form of gravitational potential energy. And this is the same concept behind the pump storage hydro that I was just talking about for grid storage. But now I'd like you to take a, think, take a moment to think about what would happen if I opened this valve between the two tanks. Just a few seconds. Okay, this is kind of a trick question, but if you said nothing, then you were right. But why? Well, because of the air that's trapped in these tanks, there would be no way to move the air from the bottom to the top tank as the water flowed down the hill. So nothing would happen if we opened the valve. So instead, if we add an extra pipe and a valve for the air to move back and forth, now the water can flow. And as that happens, we can use that to do useful work. Now, of course, we want this to be a rechargeable battery. So if we add a pump on the return line, we can pump air back in the other direction and force water back uphill, storing energy. Now batteries work in much the same way, but instead of gravitational potential energy, they use chemical potential energy. And we're all familiar with how chemical bonds can store energy. That's what we do when we burn gasoline or wood or anything. We're just releasing the energy that's stored in the chemical bonds as heat. In this case though, we separate that chemical reaction into two half reactions, one occurring at each electrode of the battery. And this allows us to generate high quality electricity instead of releasing heat. And this is why batteries can be dramatically more efficient than anything, any combustion process. Now to finish the analogy, instead of the height of the water, we have the voltage of the battery. That's the difference in potential which comes from the difference in the energy levels of the two electrodes, which is essentially how much a lithium ion or any ion, depending on what type of battery it is, wants to be in one electrode versus another. And that will determine how much we can force electrons through the external circuit because electrons can't travel through the separator and through the electrolyte because it only conducts ions so the electrons are forced through the external circuit and that's how we use them to do useful work. So then the capacity of the battery is the same as the amount of water in our tank. The airflow is the electrical current. That's what's forced through the external circuit and what we can use to, to discharge and charge our battery. And then finally, the ionic current is the water flow here. That happens inside the battery. So we can't see that. But the amount of energy that we can store with water is proportion, proportionate to the amount of water and how high it is. And in a battery, it's the amount of water or the capacity times the voltage of the battery or the difference in the energy levels. Now for rechargeable batteries, because we wanna be able to do this over and over again, it's also very important that whatever happens during the discharge and recharging processes doesn't damage the materials inside the battery so that we can go back to the beginning and do it all over again. Now, over the previous decades, we've come up with a lot of different types of batteries. You know, we're all familiar with lead acid batteries. Many of us are familiar with nickel metal hydride batteries that have been used in, for instance, the Prius hybrid uh, cars for a long time or power tools. And then more recently, we've gone to predominantly lithium ion batteries shown here in blue. But actually this article that has this plot is 20 years old now. And because of some dramatic advances in lithium ion battery technology, we've actually pushed this out all the way to here. And what this means is that we have lighter weight and smaller batteries that can store the same amount of energy. Because on the X and Y axes of this plot, we have energy density in terms of how much energy we can store per weight per kilogram. And on the y-axis, we have energy density in terms of how much energy we can store in terms of space or liters. Um, now, just to, as a bit of a, a teaser for what's to come, we've also made some advances in lithium metal for the red one. Now, you notice that the red one says it's unsafe. So of course, we don't want to use that. But some recent developments just in the past couple of years have really made it seem possible to enable what I'll call tomorrow's lithium metal batteries and they are safe, intrinsically safe, which could be a game changer. 
but I'll get to that later. So this is great in theory that we can store energy like this, but how do we actually make batteries? Well, we basically paint them. So here's a video. So this, this is actually happening on the University of Michigan campus. We have basically a giant KitchenAid mixer that mixes up the different active components with some binder and electronically conductive additive. And then we paint that onto a very thin copper foil. That's the, the black stuff is the electrode, the, the orange is the copper here. It goes through various drying phases and we collect it on this roll to roll system. We punch out uh, these pieces of that, that foil into the size of our electrodes and then we can stack them together layer upon layer to build cells or batteries with higher and higher uh, storage capacity. And if we look, take a closer look at these cells after they're assembled, we can see on the left here, this is just a planar stack of many layers of electrode. You have metal foil, and then you have graphite is the negative electrode that's used in lithium ion batteries. Then you have a porous separator material, and then you have your cathode material, and then another metal foil, and then you repeat that. And you can either do that in a planar fashion. So like for a cell phone or a laptop, you have this rectangular prism-like battery. That's just a, a bunch of st stacked, a bunch of these electrodes stacked, or in a cylindrical cell, say like a double A, you have this jelly roll of electrodes that's wound up. And that's how we build capacity is by just adding more and more layers of these cells. And if we zoom in, you can see that these electrodes are really made up of a bunch of little tiny particles with some gaps in between. And what makes the battery work is that you put an electrolyte in here that conducts lithium ions back and forth. And that electrolyte is a liquid and it can permeate, permeate into all the little nooks and crannies. And that allows the lithium ions to get in and out rather quickly. So we end up with a structure like this. And this is kind of the state of, your, state of the art. We have graphite on one side, and then we have some lithium metal oxide on the other side. We can use combinations of nickel and cobalt and manganese and iron to make up that uh, electrode component. But they're all kind of operating under the same principles. And where this gets us is we can store you know, somewhere around 500 watt hours per liter of battery, we can get, you know, a little above 200 watt hours per kilogram. But what makes lithium ions really good is how reversibly we can cycle them. So if we don't push things too hard, we can charge and discharge these batteries well over a thousand times with very minimal fading capacity because the Coulomb efficiency, not the energy efficiency, but the amount of lithium that we put in versus the amount of lithium that we get out, that can be well over 99%, well over 99.9% .9 even. So we can do this over and over and over again. So if we put these batteries in a car, for instance, we can drive for a really, really long time, um, as long as we can recharge periodically, of course. And finally, we've already mentioned cost, um, but the cost has come down dramatically into a range that has really made electric vehicles possible. So this is where we're at now. When we think about battery performance, what would our ideal battery look like? We, of course, want it to recharge real quickly. We know this from you know, dealing with cell phones that take forever to charge. Um, if you've ever ridden in a, an electric vehicle that was made you know, more than a couple of years ago, um, they take a long time to recharge. You can you know, commute back and forth, but then you have to charge it overnight in order to get a full charge again. Um, we want it to last a really long time. We, of course, want the, the uh, production of these batteries to have minimum uh, environmental impact. We want them to be affordable. We want to be able to drive a long way without having a massive heavy battery pack. And we, of course, want them to be safe. So what does this translate to in terms of actual properties of the battery? Well, it has to have good rate capability. That means we can charge and discharge it quickly. It needs to last for more than 800 cycles or so, and it'll have a long calendar life. So that if you park your car for a couple of weeks, you're not gonna come back and your battery's dead forever. Um, it, should be, it should use as earth abundant materials as possible and be easy to make in terms of manufacturing processes. It should have high energy density so you can store a lot of energy in a small space with a small weight. And it should be, have stable components that are abuse tolerant. So first let's take a look at fast charging. Now, how important is fast charging really? Well, for daily commuting, 
uh, not really very important because really any electric vehicle would be fine for that. As long as you have enough range to get to work and back, then you can slowly charge at home in most cases. But where fast charging becomes really important is for longer drives. Like say for instance, if I were to drive from here in Ann Arbor to Baltimore, which is a little over 500 miles. Well, let's consider two different cars, which are the same, but a little bit different, the red and the blue. The red car has just 200 miles of range. And I'd really, I'd only feel comfortable using about 160 of that or so, because we don't want to risk running out of energy, right? Same thing with gas. You don't drive to the last drop. You see the, the uh, you know, gas light come on and then you, you fill up relatively quickly. Um, but this red car can be charged in just 15 minutes. In contrast, the blue car has double the range, 400 miles, but it takes an hour to recharge. So which car would get me there faster? What do you think? Well, in the red car, I'd have to stop to recharge three times and it would take me a little over eight and a half hours to get there. In the blue car, I'd only have to stop once, but it would still take me a few minutes longer. In addition to being faster, the red car is also a much more pleasant drive as you can stop and use the bathroom, grab some coffee, a snack, and be back on the road every couple of hours. Whereas to hit this eight hours and 41 minutes mark in the blue car, you'd have to drive for the entire range of the car, which is more than five hours straight in order to hit that time. So this kind of really highlights the importance of fast charging as it can overcome some of the range limitations of the battery and overcome range, and range anxiety concerns. In addition, as you'd expect, a car with half of the battery capacity will be substantially cheaper to make, use a lot less materials and energy and water to produce. Now, in order for this to be true, this, this time charging stations and particular, particularly DC fast charging stations must be available all along the route so that that doesn't slow you down. But this is already true for a lot of regions, including this drive because it's mostly interstates. And the number of charging stations is expanding very quickly to match the rapid expansion of electric vehicles. So fast charging is really important for widespread EV adoption because it overcomes range anxiety and convenience and concerns. So what actually limits us from charging our batteries really quickly? Well, the main limitation comes from the graphite anode side of the battery. And to, to explain the rate performance side, I need to explain a little bit about what happens the first time that you charge a battery. Not the first time that, time that we charge a battery, but at the manufacturing plant, they charge the battery for the first time very slowly. Because when we put this graphite into an electrolyte, which is these lithium ions turning green with the red solvents around them, when we start to put lithium ions into the graphite, the first few are like, hey, this isn't so bad. But as you try to stuff more and more in, the energy level of the lithium ions increases. And at a certain point, it becomes possible for the electrons in the graphite to jump, not just to, to meet with a lithium ion, but to actually reduce the electrolyte itself and decompose it, which of course we don't want. But as it turns out, and somewhat serendipitously, in state-of-the-art lithium ion batteries, we actually form what's called a solid electrolyte interphase. And that's P-H-A-S-E, not F-A-C-E. So it's actually an extra layer shown here in blue. And that layer, just by chance again, happens to conduct these lithium ions, but not electrons. So then it passivates the surface and prevents further reaction from taking place. And this is why lithium ion batteries are so good at charging and discharging over and over and over again. So now we have this graphite particle with a solid electrolyte interface on the surface or SEI. So what happens when we try to charge very quickly? Well, because lithium ions are flowing from one side of the battery to the other, shown here, we end up with a concentration gradient. And at the surface of the graphite electrode, we have more lithium ions than deeper in. And this causes current focusing at the very surface so we fully lithiate those graphite particles and essentially the lithium ions pile up at that interface. And eventually, rather than wanting to diffuse all the way into this deep, porous, tortuous electrode, 
the lithium ions just plate out as a metallic lithium rather than going between the layers of this graphite structure. So the problem with this is that lithium metal is extremely reactive. It's not stable in contact with the electrolyte. You don't have this protective solid electrolyte interface. And so then you react with the electrolyte. And then when you try to discharge your battery, you can't get all of that lithium metal back. So you directly lose capacity in the battery. And over many cycles, that lithium, the dead lithium, piles up at the surface and impedes further lithium ions from going through as well. So then you know, you'll lose your capacity for battery very quickly, just you know, a few tens of cycles maybe, if you try to charge too quickly. Now, like I said, I'm a fan of analogies. So let's consider a situation with a toll on a road. So this is the Bay Bridge. You can see there's lots of cars piled up. So if we wanted to make this faster, just like we want to get lithium ions into our graphite faster, how would we do it? Well, two things come to my mind. One, we could open up more lanes, right? We can make a lot more lanes for cars to go through, or we could streamline the process and give everyone easy paths. So I use this analogy because my group over the past couple of years has come up with a couple of technologies to enable fast charging of graphite electrodes. And the two technologies do these two things, basically. The first is structuring the electrode to build in these little holes that allow the lithium ions to get deeper into the electrode structure more quickly. And then the second is coating the electrode rather than naturally forming this SEI interface on the surface, we apply an artificial one first that is essentially like easy pass for lithium ions. It helps them go into the graphite very quickly. So first let's look at the electrode structure. So we use a, a ultraviolet laser to cut a bunch, an array of holes in the electrode, and we can very precisely control the spacing and diameter and all of that. It looks like this. We call them highly ordered laser patterned electrodes or hole electrodes. So how well does it work? Well, here's a plot of the capacity of a battery versus cycle number. And here we're trying to charge this battery in just 15 minutes. And as you can see in this normal unpatterned electrode, after just 50 cycles, we've already lost almost 30% of the capacity of the battery. Meaning that if we initially had a 300 mile range EV, now we could only drive 200 miles. In contrast, the whole electrode with the, the pattern little holes enables very stable cycling under these conditions, only losing a couple of percent over 100 cycles. Now this is great, but can we go even faster? After all, it only takes a few minutes to pump gas, and that is a real comp competition here. As shown here, we in fact can go faster. We can charge this battery in just 10 minutes. We call that 6C. And we only, again, lose a few percent capacity over this first 100 cycles, not losing very much capacity at all. And this turns out to continue for a lot more cycles as well, retaining well over 80% capacity, which is often used as like a, a failure uh, point for electric vehicle batteries. And we can retain that for over 500 cycles with just 10 or 15 minute charge times, which beats the Department of Energy's target for fast charge performance. And for a 300 mile range EV, this would mean that we'd be able to drive over 150,000 miles if we fast charged every single cycle. But remember, we don't fast charge all the time, really only on long trips. And so because the slow charging life is much longer, these batteries would probably last over a million miles of driving in these cars. So probably the batteries would outlast the car that they're in. The second strategy, which is like easy pass for lithium ions is to again, put a coating on the surface. And we use a technique called atomic layer deposition. I won't go too deep into that, but basically we expose these electrodes after we make this electrode foil to a sequence of chemicals, uh, lithium terputoxide and triacetyl borate, along with ozone. And we do this in a cyclic manner. And then we can build our batteries. And now we have this coating on the surface. Uh, this is an electron microscope image of a cross section through one of these electrodes. Um, I used a focused ion beam to cut through the electrode just to see how well I was able to coat the graphite particle. And you can see this coating that gets into all the little nooks and crannies of this graphite. So it already protects the surface of the graphite, 
before we do any charging. And the result is a better interface. So shown here in purple is the resistance of the solid electrolyte interface, either the natural one or my artificial one. Um, the artificial one here is this LBCO 250X uh, cell here. And you can see that this is ohms, so lower is better. My artificial one has less than one quarter of the resistance as the natural one. And what this means is that instead of the lithium ions piling up at the surface, and plating out as lithium metal, shown here as the silvery stuff at the top, we can now get the lithium ions into the graphite. And I should point out that graphite has this handy habit of changing color when it's lithiated, so we can actually visually see as the battery is charging where the lithium is going. So this is great. So how does it translate to performance? Again, this is plotting capacity versus cycle number. Uh, instead of losing you know, 30 plus percent in the first 50 cycles, we lose around 10. Um, and over 500 cycles, we're still able to retain more than 80% capacity under these 15 minute charging conditions. And the good thing, or another good thing, is that these two methods improve performance in different ways. So really they should be able to be combined and further improve cycling performance. And so we're really excited about these two technologies uh, and hopefully you'll, you'll see them in an electric vehicle sometime soon. Now, we don't just care about performance though, right? We also care about environmental impact. So we want to use uh, abundant materials and we want to make them easy to make and that will also make things affordable. So just a bit of history, when lithium ion batteries were first developed, uh, they used lithium cobalt oxide as the cathode material. But cobalt is almost exclusively mined in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is obviously a very politically unstable place. Um, plus there's a lot of uh, social justice concerns about mining elsewhere. So over the past decade or so, we've switched from cobalt oxide to a mixture of nickel, manganese, and cobalt oxide, initially in a one to one to one ratio, and then a six to two to two ratio. And now we're really settled on 811, which is of course much better, but it still uses some cobalt. And now the nickel supply is becoming a major concern. There's more nickel, but it's also still mined in some sensitive areas. So it's really, become a major concern, both from a um, social justice standpoint and also from a cost standpoint, because the raw materials represent a huge fraction of the cost of lithium ion batteries. So we really need some more work in developing nickel and cobalt free cathode chemistries. And there's a lot of exciting directions there. Uh, in fact, Tesla is planning on switching from this NMC material towards lithium iron phosphate, which uses iron, a much more earth abundant material, uh, and that will be used in their lower cost cars that of course are mass produced. So that, that'll be a big factor there. Um, and there's also a lot of efforts to reduce the impacts of manufacturing such as removing hazardous solvents in the manufacturing process, going to water-based methods or even dry methods um, as well. Now, the initial manufacturing is, is one consideration, but there's also a lot of interesting things to think about over the life cycle of these batteries. First, you know, after we use the battery, so we manufacture the battery and then we use the battery, we can do a few things. First, we, we could just throw it in the landfill. We really don't want to do that. Second, we could recycle the materials. We could either directly recycle the electrodes, put them back into a new battery. We could, or we could do various methods of taking them down to their uh, constituent elements and remaking the materials that go in. There's trade-offs there, what makes more sense. But what I want to point out here is that we can also put them to a second use because electric vehicles are a really demanding application. We, you know, once our range gets down to maybe 70 or 80%, then we're not happy with the battery um, and we want to get a new one. So it doesn't make sense to just throw those batteries away or even to recycle them. We can give them a second life. And this is one interesting study that looks at, you know, in a couple of different cases for EV adoption, either a base case or if they're really successful, a brace proof case. But in either case, by 2030, the repurposed batteries from electric vehicles could represent a substantial fraction to all of the demand for grid scale storage, which that's shown in gray. So, you know, while the battery manufacturing does have significant impacts, there are some 
very important considerations that we really need to be emphasizing along with you know just better performance in order to really minimize the impact of the whole system including recycling second use and using less impactful materials so finally i'd just like to look at um you know how far can lithium ion batteries actually take us so this plot is currently where we're at more or less so we're using predominantly graphite electrodes on the bottom there's a whole bunch of different cathode materials that we've tried over the years and then some new ones these fluorides over here but on the left is kind of what we'd expect the energy density to be um, ultimately and just for context the tesla model 3 it's somewhere around 250 watt hours per kilogram, depending on who you ask. A Chevy Bolt, a little bit less, but similar. So graphite, we're pretty much maxed out where we can get. We can mix in a little bit of silicon, which can host a lot more lithium ions per silicon atom than graphite can. So that gives us a little bit higher, but still there's really a ceiling. We're not probably gonna get much above 300 watt hours per kilogram if we're continuing to use these anodes, but if we can switch to using lithium metal, getting rid of the host material entirely, then we can get much higher energy densities. So while there are incremental improvements left for lithium ion battery chemistries, lithium metal could be a disruptive step change. But there are some really big challenges with using lithium metal. In fact, lithium metal electrodes were invented before lithium ion electrodes, but they were just never commercialized because they weren't safe, which is why on that plot it said not safe. And I spent a couple of years of my PhD trying to understand how we could control the things that make lithium metal unsafe. Specifically, when you plate lithium metal during charging, it doesn't plate as a nice uniform film. It grows as these dendrites. And then when you strip, you can't get it all back. So you get dead lithium that piles up. And then you hit the surface, which further degrades the interface. And you grow more dendrites. It's a nasty cycle that leads to premature failure of the cell. And it can also short circuit the battery, which of course we don't want. It can be catastrophic and definitely doesn't meet our last criteria here of being safe. So what can we do about this? Well, in the past few years, we've actually made significant progress in just getting rid of the flammable liquid electrolyte altogether. So instead of this situation with a liquid, we replace the electrolyte with a solid material that is intrinsically non-flammable and totally safe. So the question is, can, can we do this? Can we still make batteries using solid electrolytes? And would that allow us to prevent dendrite growth and instead plate a thin film of lithium metal that just increased and decreased in, in thickness? Because if we could, we of course get the safety benefits of not having anything flammable in the cell. You know, we could potentially enable very long cycle life and improved energy density. And there's some pack level benefits where you don't need to worry about the temperature of the battery so much. If it gets too hot, it's not a big deal. It just works better. Um, and packaging could become easier. And just last year, we saw really the first proof of concept that was like, wow, this could actually work. It came from Samsung. And this slide just shows, you know, this is what the battery looked like, but it was an all solid state battery. It lasted a thousand cycles. Um, and barely lost any capacity. This had a lithium metal electrode in it. And just a reminder, um, you know, a thousand cycles would be, you know, over 300,000 miles of range in an electric vehicle. So this is a big deal. So can this actually happen? Can solid state batteries displace lithium ion batteries? Well, if that's going to happen, it's going to require there to be a large benefit of solid state batteries. In particular, we need high energy density. So and not just an incremental improvement above lithium ion batteries because lithium ion batteries are already established. So it has to be a step change increase in energy density. And that's what the Samsung paper basically showed was that in fact, we can make these cells with close to a thousand watt hours per liter. Reminder, the best Tesla are like 500 to 600 watt hours per liter. So a dramatic increase. Um, and they need to be safe. So no liquids around, nothing flammable. Um, we need to be able to reduce the cost and space used for battery management system, temperature control, those types of things. We can't sacrifice on cycle life. And in fact, we wanna get much better. And this is where we start getting, getting into things that are really tricky and, and are 
pushing the frontier. We need to be able to still fast charge these batteries because we already talked about how important fast charging is. And that's very challenging in solid state batteries. We need to be able to manufacture them in low cost ways, establish a supply chain using earth abundant materials and, and in a way that we can scale this up to a massive scale for both electric vehicles and grid storage. And ideally they would have some compatibility with existing production lines for lithium ion batteries, because just in the past decade, many billions of dollars have been invested in building lithium ion production facilities. So if they're compatible with those, it will really help with adoption. So where are we at? Well, there's still some challenges out there, some associated with the individual materials, some associated with how stable the interfaces are during cycling, both fast charging and fast discharging, and the low temperature poses some significant challenges. And there's also some challenges with manufacturability of full cells. So where are we at? Well, over the past decade or so, we've developed a wide range of materials that are all solid electrolytes that conduct ions very well. Some are more stable than others in contact with lithium metal. Some have better mechanical properties. Some are more processable, et cetera. There's no material that really has ideal properties all around the spider plot. And what's really interesting is that, you know, industry has not decided which of these makes the most sense for commercialization. And there's different companies that have chosen different champions all across the map, basically. We have some using sulfide-based materials, which have challenges with air stability, but are, have higher ion conductivity, they're more processable. Then you have a company like QuantumScape, which uses an oxide material, which is more difficult to process, but it's more stable. Uh, they all have trade-offs. So it really becomes a game of which of these doesn't have an Achilles heel that we can't overcome. Now. More recently, I've spent a lot of time understanding some of these key challenges. So during charging, you know, we, we, I drew that little cartoon that maybe solid electrolytes can compress the lithium instead of growing dendrites, you flatten that out and it grows as a uniform film. In fact, if you try, try to charge too fast, the lithium can actually penetrate and grow these filaments into the solid electrolyte. So I've done a lot of work to understand, you know, how that works, why it's happening and then ways to overcome. And then during discharge, Remember, this is a solid material, so it's not like the liquid where if you form a pit during discharging, the liquid can just flow into that pit. Here, they are rigid materials in contact. So if you form a void and you lose contact there, it'll degrade the performance of your battery over time. So this is a really important problem. The good news is that just in the last few months, we've seen some really exciting demonstrations from the industry side, these startup companies that seem to indicate that some of these challenges are being overcome. For instance, this from QuantumScape shows that their solid state battery with a lithium metal anode can charge to 80% capacity in less than 15 minutes, which is significantly better than even you know, state-of-the-art Tesla supercharging technology. And these batteries meet the cycle life requirements, retaining around 90% of the capacity over you know, 800 to 1,000 cycles. Um, so this is you know, really exciting. And another company, Solid Power, is a startup company as well, um, which is associated with Ford and BMW now, um, show that you can, they can operate down to minus 10 degrees C, uh, they can do 50% fast charge in 10 minutes, and they can make these large format pouch cells over here, which are what we need for electric vehicles. So I'm almost done, um, but I just wanna say that, you know, because of all these promising lithium ion technologies and the solid state, the biggest automotive companies in the world are really betting on electric vehicles being the future. For instance, Volkswagen, the largest, has, is investing tens of billions of dollars in, in EV efforts. They're going to have uh, 70 fully electric vehicle models by 2028, and they're investing a lot of money in solid state batteries as well. Um, Toyota, both uh, huge efforts in electric vehicles and solid state. Um, Daimler, Ford, GM has said that by 2035, they're not going to be really producing any solely internal combustion engine vehicles. So really, they're, they're betting on, on electric um, to be the future. And many of the big players are actually targeting the mid-2020s for the rollout of solid-state batteries in consumer vehicles, which you know <laughs> seems like not very far away. But it, there's a huge driving force because you know if we can enable solid-state batteries, it's this step jump from lithium-ion. So it's a really exciting prospect and I hope we get there. So um, 
I'd just like to leave you with a few key takeaways. One, um, I think lithium ion batteries are currently the best option for both grid storage and vehicle electrification. They will continue to get better and cheaper for several years, particularly fast charging and higher energy density. But we need significant efforts to address life, life cycle impacts, such as removing cobalt and nickel and uh, recycling and repurposing efforts. The, I think the future of electric vehicles is extremely bright you know, a dramatic change to the vehicle fleet is going to happen in the next five years uh, as electric vehicles will soon be cheaper to make, longer lasting and higher performance than internal combustion equivalents. And solid state batteries could be a game changer. That's still not certain. Um, we'll see who, who wins that race, but either way, I think electric vehicles are, are going to, to really roll out quickly. Um, but again, this must be accompanied by a dramatic expansion of re renewable electricity production and a decrease in other energy demands um, by you know, conservation, conservation efforts and rollout of solar, wind, et cetera. And finally, um, I wanna emphasize, we, there is still a lot of work to be done on battery technology to lessen the life cycle impacts of energy storage. Now with that, I'd like to thank uh, my research group, the Dasgupta Research Group at the University of Michigan, uh, as well as um, a few of my collaborators at Michigan and funding agencies, automotive companies that we work with uh, and contributed some of the content for this talk. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening and uh, I'd love to answer some questions through the chat. Thank you, Eric. That was a fascinating talk, especially having you explain sort of the state of lithium ion batteries and the up and coming lithium metal batteries. It's very exciting to hear that. Um, one of our questions is about the sustainable aviation fuels from biofuels. These are being pursued in the aviation sector. And I know you didn't talk about the aviation sector today, but our question is about this. Given that the lithium ion batteries are getting lighter um, and with higher energy densities, is there a potential to use lithium ion in aircraft, um, such as short range, air, short range aircraft? Assuming that we ignore the safety related implications and speaking just purely from an energy efficiency standpoint, what are your thoughts on this? The short answer is yes, there is potential there. Um, I think that's further off just because in order to be viable, especially for longer range flights, but even for shorter range flights, the, the gravimetric energy density. So for aviation, uh, weight matters more than size for um, electric vehicles. Size matters more for weight than weight. Um, but for for uh, planes, it's really weight. And there's uh, some progress to be made there, especially lithium metal batteries are much lighter um, than their lithium ion equivalents. So I think lithium metal batteries do present uh, an interesting possibility there. I'd also say there are already some efforts with uh, aviation electrification um, both for commercial applications as well as um, defense applications. They're already using uh, batteries for like drones and things like that, um, like the larger scale drones. So yes, there are potentials there, but I think in the short term, the biofuels make more sense in terms of reducing the impacts of the aviation sector, just because we're a little bit further off, especially from, from a energy density and cost perspective. Um, for, for lithium ion batteries. Okay, that's good to hear um, in terms of just your perspective on that. Um, another question, and this was with respect to the recyclability of batteries. You talked a bit about this. Our question is, will we, be, will we ever be able to recycle batteries 100% to be able to transition to a circular system? I suppose it depends what you mean by 100%. It will always require energy, of course, to take the materials at the end of life and put them back in. Uh, so it's not a perfectly efficient system in that sense. I think some of the components could be made to be more recyclable. And there's a lot of work to be done in the design for end of life aspect. So how can we change the design of batteries so that it's easier to take them apart and repurpose various components? Um, and, and solid state batteries actually present a really interesting uh, possibility there because the liquid electrolyte right now poses a lot of challenges um, because it's volatile and flammable um, and gets everywhere when you disassemble the, the battery. It, it makes it very difficult to isolate the different components and then separate the lithium from the 
the nickel from the manganese and such. Um, but I think we can make significant strides there. Um, I'll bring up one backup slide that I have on kind of, you know, the role of, of recycled supply. So one of the things like pe people talk a lot about recycled supply, but because the rate, because of the rate of growth of, of battery demand, it's going to be a while before recycled materials actually represent a large fraction of the supply. Because, you know, if you only had a million electric vehicles in, in 2020, and now you have 100 million vehicles in 2030, you know, only 1% of the, the, what you now need to produce is going to come from recycled supply. Um, but longer term, I think recycling will be a huge, huge deal. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then another question is from one of your earlier slides, why is the rejected energy largely from fossil fuels at 67.5%? So I think this is one of your earlier slides when you were showing the fossil fuels and what was coming from renewables. Um, is that primarily due to energy conversion efficiencies or is that due to just poor storage infrastructure? So right now we don't store energy that much. So most of the rejected energy is not from storage, it's from um, inherent production losses because most of our electricity comes from burning things. And I talked a little briefly about this, but um, electricity is a much higher quality form of energy. And whereas combustion produces heat and heat is very difficult to get all of the energy out of. So, you know, uh, uh, in an internal combustion engine vehicle, you know, we only get less than 30%, round, round, round about 25% of the energy in the gasoline is even converted into uh, mechanical energy to move the car. And actually there's a lot of losses after that with friction at the wheels and air resistance and all of that, but um, that all contributes to rejected energy. For electricity generation, there's also a big loss due to transmission because you lose a lot of energy when we're moving electricity miles and miles and miles through high voltage lines. Okay, so maybe it helps to think of it in terms of wasted energy because it's just not a perfect, yeah. it's not efficient. Okay, right. that makes sense. And then I guess we have two minutes left. So I just have one last question. Um, and this question is, you mentioned um, you did a really good job explaining about the, uh, the cobalt and why that's trying to be reduced in terms of um, using cobalt in the cathode chemistry and also the nickel. Um, but my question was with respect to lithium itself, um, is there any concern about the sustainable use or of, of extraction of lithium for, for the batteries? Yes, there, there, there is concern, certainly. Um, the consensus is, from what I, from my understanding, that there is enough lithium um, in the world to, you know, transition all the vehicles from gasoline to either lithium-ion or lithium metal batteries. Um, now that, of course, there are impacts. Any mining operation ever has impacts, which again emphasizes the importance of recycling, reusing this the lithium from the old batteries and putting it back into new batteries. Um, this map just shows kind of where the global lithium deposits or reserves that are known of reside. A huge chunk of them are in South America, in Bolivia, in Chile, um, as well as Australia yeah, and Russia and China. Um, so um, I, I don't have too much more to say than that. Um, this is not really my area of study in terms of the, the mining side and the, the earth abundance side. But my, my understanding is that there is enough. There are, of course, implications associated with extracting that, um, but lithium less so than the transition metals like nickel and of, of definitely cobalt. All right, excellent. Well, it sounds like a good topic to have one of my classes explore. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for such a wonderful talk, for taking what seems like it would be a really complex topic and breaking it down for our, our our audience, which comes from a wide background. And um, since we're right up against three o'clock, I would like to say thank you. And since we can't do um, applause in person, I would ask our, our viewers to do virtual applause in the chat box so we can at least know that you've been uh, viewing us. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, uh, Eric. And um, please join us again later um, next month for the next in our series.
Thank you very much. Thanks.